God has done for us in the past though. But change is natural. See, I don't think we should forget about all the goodness that God did in our lives, okay? But this remembrance of remembering what God has done for us in the past should never become a bondage to keep us from pursuing our future. This remembrance should act as a springboard launching us into our future. See, when we remember you hear people about the good old days, the good old days should never be something that get us stuck in the past. If you think about the good old days, it should remind us about God's faithfulness in our future. And so change is natural. Over in Deuteronomy chapter 34, it says, Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is across, the, across from Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali in the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judea as far as the western sea, the south and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of Palms as far as Zorro. And now if we'll go over to Joshua, which turn a couple pages over there, and let's go to Joshua chapter 1. Because what we're finding out in Deuteronomy 37 is God showed Moses the promised land. We're going to talk about, remember, change is natural. Okay? And it says in verse 1 in Joshua 1, after the death of Moses, you know we're all going to die unless Jesus comes back. You know that? Death is natural. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. So what are we finding out here, folks? And this is what I want us to remember here in life. God's promises are true always, but sometimes it takes different ways to get to God's promises. What did God promise the children of Israel as they were getting ready or when they were in Egypt? He said, I'm going to lead you to the promised land. That's what he told them, okay? And so what we're finding out in life is this. He said, I'm going to lead you to the promised land. And was God faithful in leading them? Yes. Did Moses take them there? Not into the promised land. Joshua did. So there was a natural change here, but God kept his word. See, it's our human nature to remember the past and want to stay in it. Why do you think God told Joshua? He was pretty forthright. He said, Moses, my servant, is dead. He was telling Joshua, you know what, Joshua? Now it's up to you. Change is here. So what we need to realize, but our human nature is we like to always want to stay in the past. And when you and I stay in our past, you know what it does? Our divine destiny gets further and further away. As we remember the past and God's goodness, then we can know, you know what? He was good to me in my past. I know he's going to be good to me in my future. And I can reach my destiny and I can achieve it. What's the number one hindrance in obtaining God's future for our lives? For our church, for our family, it's not the devil many times. It's always trying to live and duplicate the past. That's our number one hindrance. It's not the devil. It's We're trying to either live or duplicate in our past. That's why I really do enjoy Christ the King. I, I realize we're here, we're building a new home and all, but I really do. And one of the things I've never forgot. You know, we're only 12 years old, okay? We're just an adolescent yet, do you understand? But I've never forgot one thing that Dean Watchorn said once at one of our council meetings. He said, guys, we've not been here long enough to have any sacred cows. You know, I mean, you know, there are some churches that are maybe 100, 150 years old, and I tell you what, there are sacred cows there. Do you understand? Well, we've only been here 12 years. We don't have time for sacred cows. You know what I always tell about people about sacred cows? Sacred cows make holy hamburgers. You know that? And God doesn't want us to have a bunch of sacred cows. It's really kind of amazing. We can make fun of maybe people living in India and all this about sacred cows, but sometimes we have our own, okay? And so we need to realize that. So we can't live in the past, okay? That's what hinders most people. Look at what it says in Luke chapter 9, verse 61 and 62. 
And it says, and another one, this is what Jesus was talking to people, calling them to be his disciples. And another one also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my home or my house. And Jesus said to him, look it, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. What was Jesus telling this person? You can't live in the past if you want to go to the future. I've always asked this. You know, Ellie's going to be driving pretty soon. Addie is too. Maggie already is and some of these others, okay? You know what? Do you want your kid looking in the rearview mirror or the front windshield? I got news for you. The windshield is big. The rear view, mirror, rear view mirror is small. God says, don't be looking back as you're going forward. And you know what? We would get in trouble in life if we wanted to drive our car that way. And God is saying, you know what? Don't keep looking back saying, I wish, I wish, I, like it used to be. God says, you know what? It was good there. Now I got something better for you now. If you're taking notes, and you can do it on the back of the bulletin. Remember this, Jesus isn't married to any one method. Jesus isn't married to a method. Jesus is married to the church. That would have been a great place to say amen or oh my, hallelujah. (laughs) Jesus isn't married to a method. He's married to the church, his bride. He is concerned about his message being proclaimed in the world. That's what he's concerned about. You've heard me say this before. A change is inevitable. Growth is optional. For most people, the thought of change is unnerving. And you know what? It was no different than Joshua. Can you imagine just with fear and trepidation what Joshua had to say? Here he's following Moses. Moses, the one that God used to bring that bring the ten plagues on Egypt. Here's the one that led millions of people out of the wilderness, out of Egypt, into the wilderness, where he struck the rock and water came out. He's following a legend. And I'm sure he thought, I can't do this. Look what it says in Joshua chapter 1. And we're going to go down into verse 9. See, God is saying, Don't worry about the past. He says, have, this is what the Lord says to, the, uh, to Joshua. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed. This is what is great. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I don't think the future looks so scary now. Hallelujah. Jesus said, I'm going to go with you wherever you go. All of a sudden, I know Jesus has walked and talked with me in my past. And he says, you know what? Wherever you go, I'm going to go with you too. I tell you what, folks. I'm not worried about the past. I'm excited for the future because I'm not going there alone. Fear will paralyze us and rob us of our God-ordained future. Fear. Has anybody ever been afraid before? Really afraid? And it just doesn't it just paralyze you? You, you can't do anything. See, fear paralyzes us. Faith will propel us into our promised land and cause us to triumph over our enemies. Fear kept the children of Israel out of, out of the promised land for 40 years. Those guys are too big in the promised land. We can't go. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. But faith propelled them 40 years later into the promised land to obtain their God-given destiny. We, and get this, no, we must never confuse personal preference with God-ordained direction. I say that again. We should never confuse personal preference with God-ordained direction. If we do, you know what happens? Division, confusion, and the other works of the flesh will come and tear apart a family. It'll tear apart a business. It'll tear apart a church if we let personal preferences overwhelm and overrule God's word. Look what it says over in Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. We're talking about change is inevitable. Change is natural. We're going to go down in Matthew chapter 15, verses 4 through 6. 
Uh, it says, for, for God commanded you, saying, honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father and mother, whatever profit you might have, have received me, is a gift of God. He said, in verse 6, he says, but you have made the commandments of God of no effect for your tradition. What was Jesus telling these people, these Jewish people? You've made the word of God of no effect because of your personal preferences. You know what? You might say, well, you know what? I like it hot. I like it cold. You know what? You can like it hot or you can like it cold. But don't come along and say, thus saith the Lord, God said it shall be hot. Do you understand? Let's not try to make God's word tell us what, you know, a, a, a great example is in the book of Corinthians and Romans where, where all of a sudden the apostle Paul says, you know what? If you can't eat meat that's been offered to idols, then don't eat it. But he said, if I like my filet mignon medium rare and it's been offered to the idol, then don't criticize me. See, what is he saying there? Personal preferences. And we can't go on and say, you know what? You're sinning because you ate that, that steak that was offered to the idol. No, that's a personal preference. Do you, under, you understand what I'm saying? And how many times do families, do churches, do businesses, they get torn apart because we've confused personal preferences with the Word of God. There's enough things in the Word of God that are black and white that we can agree on those things. Amen? See, we fall in love with Jesus. Not a method of presenting him to a dying, crying world. I believe every one of us are going to be surprised when we get into heaven. You know why? You know why I think that is? Because it will not be like we ever dreamed or thought of. It's going to be better. I think when we get to heaven, I bet you there's not one of us here is going to say, you know what? This is not what I thought it was going to be. I thought the gold would be a little shinier. I thought the rocks would be a little bit, you know, bigger. You know, this really isn't that great a place. No, I think when we get to heaven, it's going to be above what we could even ask or think. Amen? And so we need to realize that. See, once we get to heaven and see that it's not what we have imagined, then we each have one or two choices to do. Either we can enjoy it or we can be miserable the rest of eternity. You see, it's going to be a change of what we thought it would be. So we're either going to enjoy it or be miserable, okay? I want you to repeat after me, please. Say, the method is secondary. Say that with me. The method is secondary. The message is primary. The message is primary. Does this mean, uh, does, does the means justify the end? No, not always. But more people die from hardening of the categories than hardening of the arteries. And I want to spend the rest of my time this morning and next week looking at biblical examples of what I'm talking about. My first example I want to talk, let's go over to Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17. My first objective here I want to talk about this morning is defeating the enemies of God or Israel. Let's, what, let's see what it says in Exodus chapter 17. And we're going to start in verse 8. It says, now Amalek came and fought with Israel and Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, choose us some men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Ur went up on the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hands that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hands, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, and Aaron and Ur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. So the, what was the objective here in Moses, or in Exodus chapter 17? It was what? To win the war, to defeat the enemies of Israel. Can we all decide on that? The objective. And did God give Moses a directive? He said, go up on the hill, put your hands up, and when you, your hands are up, you'll prevail. So this was a God-ordained message, okay? Now let's go over to Joshua chapter 6. 
Joshua chapter 6. Because you know what? I admire Joshua here. And it says in Joshua chapter 6, and we're going to go down in verse uh, 1. Now, the, Joshua and the nation of Israel have come across the Jordan. Now they come to Jericho. Now let me ask you, what would most church folks do now? You know what they do? This is what most church folks would do. Let's see, when we wanted to defeat the enemies, we got Moses up on a hill and put two people underneath his arms and had him sit on a chair, and we win. So you know what most church folks would do? Let's do it again. And now we're going to find out if they would have done it again. You know what would have happened? They would have got beat. Because look at what we're finding out here in Joshua chapter 6. Remember, what is the objective here? To defeat the enemies of God. That's the objective. Look at what it says in Joshua 6. Now Jericho was securely shut up because the children of Israel, none went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, wait, remember the Lord said something to Moses. So the Lord said to Joshua, see, I've given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go around the, around the city once. You shall do this six days. And the seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And it shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horns, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people will shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go every man straight before him. So, what's the objective here, once again, in Joshua? Defeat the enemies of Israel. Are we, so the objective, the message is staying the same, isn't it? Defeat the armies of Israel. But look, at now we're using a different method. The first method was Moses lifted his hands. This method, what happens? We blow the horn and we shout, okay? Now I want us to go over to 2 Kings. 2 Kings, we're going to go into verse 7. 2 Kings chapter 7, excuse me. 2 Kings chapter 7, and we're going to go down into verse 3. This is a story, okay, where, the, where, uh, where all of a sudden uh, the Syrians had come and attacked and surrounded Jerusalem, and they... They were going to starve. They were going to die of starvation. There were four lepers outside of the wall, and they and they basically said, "You know what? We can either starve here, or we can go to the Syrian camp, and maybe they'll kill us there." But either way is no good. They said, "Now there were four leprous men in verse three in Second Kings seven. There were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate, and they said to one another, "Why are we sitting here doing nothing?" You know, in my Bible, I underline here, "Why are we sitting here doing nothing?" See, we're never going to win if we're doing nothing. You know what? These guys had leprosy. You know what leprosy was? Leprosy was like somebody come along and telling you, you have stage four cancer, you're beyond help. There was no remedy for this. And you know what most people do if they, if they think their life's ready to end? They don't want to do anything. These guys said, we're going to get up and at least do something. If we say we will enter the city, the famine is in the city and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we will also die. Now therefore come, let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. And if, and if they keep us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we will only die. I love that. We will only die. You know what I, find? I tell people all the time? Dying's easy. Living's that's hard. You die once. You have to live every day. I think living's harder. You got to make decisions. We only die. And then we're, we're present with the Lord, okay? And they arose, so they did something, okay? And they arose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. When they had come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and the noise of horses and the noise of the great army. So they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired against us the king of the Hittites and the king of the Egyptians to attack us. Therefore they arose and fled at twilight and left the camp intact, their tents, their horses, and their donkeys, and they fled for their lives. And when the lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they went into one tent, and they ate and drank and carried from it silver and gold and clothing, and went and hid it then. Then they came back and entered another tent and carried away from there, and they went back and forth. They said to one another, we are, we are not doing right. I love these guys. These guys are dying. I mean, the nation of Israel is throwing them outside, and now they're saying, you know what? This isn't right. 
They said, this isn't right. This day is a day of good news, and we remain silent. If we wait until morning, look at this. What are these guys, what do they have again? Leprosy, look at this. They said, if we wait until morning, some punishment will come upon us. They got leprosy. Are you thinking here? (laughs) Most people say, I've already been punished. Some punishment will come upon us. Now, therefore, come, let us go and tell of the king's household. So they went and called the gatekeeper of the city and told him, saying, We went to the Syrian camp, and surprisingly, no one was there. Not a human sound, only horses and donkeys tied and the tents intact. And the gatekeepers called out, and they told it to the king's household inside. What did God want to do to the Syrian army? They were the what? They were the enemies of Israel, weren't they? Come on. How did God defeat the enemies of Israel here? Four lepers. Are you starting to get the jest here? See, we get married to methods and we forget the message. Are you tracking with me here? It doesn't mean we don't have personal preferences. Do you understand? Maybe I prefer the blowing of the horns and the shout and the walls come tumbling down. That's what I like. You know? But see, we have to remember, what is the message of the church of Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ and him crucified. That at the name of Jesus, no one will get to heaven. And you got to bow your knee to Jesus and confess him as Lord. And so many times people get so confused and they get so upset with the different methods that they forget about the message. And I'm here to tell you, I love Jesus. And I tell you what, as long as I'm here, I'm going to keep lifting him up. Your method and my method may not be the same, but you know what? If your method is drawing people to Jesus, I'm happy for you, baby. You know that? I'm not going to tell you, no, you shouldn't be doing that. Don't you know that we need to go and get somebody? We got it. Well, there's four of us here. We got to put our hands up in the air. We got to get two people underneath and then we, then we'll win. No, we got to walk around the city seven times. Okay. And then blow. No, God's saying, I want to speak to you and help you hear my voice. What was the priority in each of these cases? Defeating the enemies of Israel. What was secondary in each of these cases? The method in which it was accomplished. You know what? You might raise your children one way. I raise my children the other way. Might be two different ones. I think the main objective is what do we want? We want our kids to be raised and to grow up serving Jesus. Come on. And so, you know what? We're not always going to do everything the same. But you know what? If I know your heart, if you know my heart, you, we can get together with a lot of things in life. If I know your heart. I want to do a little, one more. Can I do one more this morning? Okay. The second objective I want to look at is healing. Is healing. Okay? And one thing, you'll never get me to, to ever believe he's not. Jesus is a healer. I want you to know that. Let's go over to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. Jesus is, healing is the motive here. Healing is the objective. Over in Mark chapter 10, and we're going to go down in verse 46. This is Jesus. He's he's, he's walking through uh, Jericho, okay? And it says in Mark uh, 10, 46, And when they came to Jericho, as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, and a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging, Okay? And, and when he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Isn't this amazing? And they, the crowd. You know what? The, who was the crowd? The crowd that could see. Have you ever noticed when you're desperate? It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. Bartimaeus was blind. He was desperate. Okay? And the, they warned him to be quiet, but he cried out even louder. They said, shut up! And when they said, shut up, he cried, he cried out even louder. Son of David, have mercy on me! So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then I love this. Then they called the blind man saying, be of good cheer. Rise, he's calling you. For t- three, two verses earlier, earlier, they're saying, sit down and shut up. Now they're saying, hey, the master wants you. <laughs> this is great, isn't it? People are fickle, aren't they? They really are. 
And throwing off his garment, he arose and came to Jesus. Maybe you don't understand. This was powerful for Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus was blind. You know what kept him alive most time was his garment, his coat. That kept him warm in the cold. It kept the sun off him. That was really his safety blanket. There was something I think in Bartimaeus' spirit knew today's my day. He threw it off. What is he really saying? I'm getting rid of the past and I'm going towards the future. And he said, so Jesus answered, said to him, I always thought, isn't this one of the craziest questions you ever heard? You're talking to a blind man. And Jesus says to Bartimaeus, what do you want? Well, I'd like uh, two egg, you know, two eggs over eating. No, if you see a blind man, don't you think you're going to say, I want to see? But you know what? See, Jesus wants to hear what's in our heart. What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I might receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, go on your way. Your faith has made you whole. And immediately he re- received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. So what are we finding out here? How did he get healed here? Jesus spoke a word. Let's go over to Acts chapter 19. We're talking about healing. Acts chapter 19. And we're going to go down in verse 11 and 12. This is the apostle Paul. And all of a sudden, the Apostle Paul was a tent maker. And he had a healing ministry. It says in Acts 19, 11, Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left him, and the evil spirits went out of them. Now wait, how did Bartimaeus get healed? Jesus spoke a word. How did these people get healed? They took some handkerchiefs and aprons that Paul had prayed over and gave it to people and they were healed. See, different methods. Same objective. What is it? Let's get people healed. Amen? Amen? Amen. And the last one I want to go to is back in 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. So many times we want to have it our way. This is, God is not Burger King and you don't always get it your way. Hallelujah, okay? You get it his way, okay? 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 9 through 14. Naaman was a captain, high authority in the Syrian army. Now Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elijah's house. And Elijah sent a messenger to him and said, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh will be restored to you, and you will be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out. We see, Naaman had an idea how he was going to get healed. He had a method already. He said, He will surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. See, isn't that how we do many times? We got God all figured out. And are, are not the Abani and the, and the Parpha, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. I've seen people do that. They get mad because God doesn't do what they think he should be doing for them. You know, remember this? God is God and we're not. Amen? And as, the, and as the servants came near and spoke to him, they said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more than when he says to you, Wash and be clean. So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Here we have Jesus speaking a word. Here we have somebody laying some, some cloths on their body. Here we have somebody dipping in a dirty river. Three different ways. But what was the main objective? To receive healing. To receive healing. What makes it hard for us to accept these things? Listen to this, because you want to catch this. This is why it makes it hard for us to get out of methods that we like. Because those methods at one time were were ordained by God For that moment. I want you to get that again. What makes it so hard for us to give up the methods? Because that method was ordained by God for that moment. 
God told Moses, put your hands up. God told Joshua, blow the horns. God told them, dip in the seven, in the river. See, these methods were all God-ordained, but they were God-ordained for that moment. And then God says, you know what? We're going in the future. I have other methods to get the same objective. But you know what? You're like me. We can get lazy sometimes. And we don't want to find out what kind of method that God has for us today because we just want to use yesterday's. Come on. I, I, I know I'm talking to everybody outside of this church. Hallelujah. Make sure you get this CD for everybody you know. It's not for you. I realize that. That's what makes it hard for me. It's what makes it hard for you. It was God-ordained. It wasn't something flaky. It wasn't something that man devised. It was something that God ordained, but he ordained it for that moment. See, God says, you don't live in the past. You learn from the past. And if we get caught in that moment, I have news for you. If they would have tried to put claws on somebody that God didn't tell Paul to do that on, they wouldn't have got healed. Well, this is the way they used to always do it. And you know what, folks? Sometimes you see that with, with, in telev- with televangelists and all this and that. They'll, they'll try to say, send some money and we'll send you this stuff. And you'll, you know what? I know it worked for Paul because God ordained it. Or somebody else just trying to piggyback off that. I don't know. See, I'm saying, you and I, the Bible says, those that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons and daughters of God. See, God's Spirit wants to speak to your spirit and my spirit every day. So when we get up in the morning, we just can't say, I know what God wants today. No, it's a new day, and he gives you new mercies and new revelation every day. New methods. Same message. Jesus Christ crucified. He is the way and the truth and the life. Do you know, folks, 150, 200 years ago, they thought, actually, there are some churches today that think this is a work, a tool of the devil. A drum. You know that? There's some churches that think drums are the tool of the devil. You know what? There are some people that think that is crazy. You're getting technology into the church? Okay, who said hymnals were so spiritual? Because if I'm not mistaken, they, when God got, gave Moses his writings, they were on stones. But somehow then somebody got a method. They started putting him in a songbook. And somebody said, we like that songbook. There was nothing wrong with that songbook. But they all of a sudden said, that is holy. We can't. Folks, I have been around churches. We can't get rid of the songbooks in church. That would be so bad. Why? Now, I know I'm probably stepping on some people's toes. Say, ouch, hallelujah, you know. You know what the songbook was there for? To give us an opportunity to lift up our voices to praise the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And if that's up on that screen, it's giving me the same thing. I'm just glad you're worshiping Jesus. See, don't get tied to the method. What's the message? Let's lift up Jesus, and he will draw all men unto himself. We as people believe that just because God did it this way in the past, he's always going to do it that way in the future. This type of thinking will paralyze us from God's ordained future, and it will choke out the creativity of God's spirit in each and every one of us. Why? Because when you and I have assumed that God is going to do a work a certain way, and if that is the case, why would we need his leadings anymore? If we already know what God's going to do, why do we need to pray? Well, don't you know? You know, Joshua could have said, I don't need God to speak to me. I know what to do already. I'm going to go up on a hill. They're going to put my hands up there, and we're going to be done. See, God wants to have a relationship with each and every one of us. He wants to talk to your heart and my heart every day. He has a destiny for you every day. And if we just say, well, this is what we did yesterday. I guess this is what we'll do today. And you know what I think? We're going to miss out on what God has for us. But if every day we get up and we say, Lord... You said the steps of a righteous person are ordered by the Lord. Lead my steps today, Lord. Lead my steps today. You know, maybe I usually don't go this way. That's okay. Go that way today. Maybe God has somebody on the side of the road. Maybe there's somebody that's bleeding and dying on a Jericho road that you need to find that day. You need to pour in the oil and the wine. Maybe that's not the normal way you normally do it. Maybe, see, 
How many times people think God's spirit is spooky? It's not. God speaks to us in our heart so many times. You know what we think? It's, we call it an intuition. We call it a hunch. Folks, most of the time that's God's spirit speaking to your spirit. You know, when you got ready to, to, to close your car door and, and you said, I should get my keys out of there, and you didn't. And then as soon as you closed the door and you heard that voice say, did you get the keys out of it and it wasn't your wife's? See, God's spirit, I believe, was telling you, get the keys out of the car. Well, that doesn't sound very spiritual, Pastor Jeff. Well, you know what? Locking your keys in the car isn't too spiritual, is it? You start a little bit at a time. I tell you what, who, those that are led by God's Spirit are his sons and his daughters. He's given us the power to be those people. Amen. And so next week we're going to continue on about finding out the methods and the message. I tell you what, we, I respect methods, but I... Like I said, Jesus isn't married to methods. He's married to the church. He's married to a message. Jesus Christ. Why don't we stand up, please? Thank you, Jesus. You know, change is natural, isn't it? Change is natural. I don't know what, I don't know what the future will bring us. All I do know is it will bring us change. That I do know. I'm so grateful for change. When I was a young boy and I went to visit my grandpa and grandma and, and out in a farm in Manson, Iowa, we had an outhouse. <laughs> I was so glad for change. You know that, hallelujah. I really was. You know, I hear people, they, they're so nostalgic about the, about the past. I said, are you crazy? I love our things that we have today. You know, they're, it's not all bad, hallelujah. You know that? And just embrace them. And you know what? And make sure you're using it for his glory. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you and I praise you for this day. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, when that sun comes up each day, I know there's a new batch of mercies. There's a new batch of grace waiting for me that day. Lord God, it's like the manna from heaven. We don't have to try to pile it up so we can have enough to accumulate for two or three days. No, we can get a new batch every day if we'll just come to you, Jesus. And Lord, as eyes are closed and heads are bowed, is there anybody here this morning who say, Pastor Jeff, I need that relationship with Jesus. I need that intimacy with Jesus. I've been married to the, meth, to the method and not the message. You know, I, I, there were some things maybe I didn't care for, but now I see it's, the message is what counts, not the method. If that's you, I just want you to raise your hand. I want to pray for you right where you're at. Because I know God has so many wonderful things. Yes. Anyone else? Thank you, Jesus. I tell you what, you know, one of the, one of the things, I, you've heard me say this, saints of God, I believe soon and very soon the king is coming, but soon, we're going to build a new facility here, right door here. Some of, my, some of you might say, well, Jeff, this church is so pretty. This is a method. We move next door, we're going to keep the message. You understand? Jesus Christ, him crucified. I'm grateful. You know, I was thinking about, do you know, saints, if you walk out the front door, and look at that little plaque to your right. This church foundation was set again September 4th, 1910. See, the Presbyterians aren't here anymore, are they? But you know what? They built this place for the message of Jesus Christ. The methods changed, but the message is still going. Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, you saw those hands that were raised. Lord, I thank you and I praise you. Help us, Lord. I know each and every one of us, include myself, we have a heart that wants to serve you, Lord. We might have our personal preferences, Lord God, but more than our personal preferences, Lord God, we want to see people coming to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We want to see people living and loving Jesus in their families. We want to see marriages brought together. We want to see families restored, Lord God. We want to see bodies healed, Lord God. We want to see, we want to see the, the love of Jesus Christ flood our, the greater Ponca area, Lord, in the name of Jesus. I thank you for these people, Lord. And we give you our very best, Lord God. And Lord, thank you for this Labor Day weekend that we can rest from our labors like you did on this Shabbat, the Sabbath. What I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to pray the blessing over you 
this morning. And then we're going to sing, I am a friend of God. And I just want to tell you, thank you for coming. Remember, Pastor Bradley, I'm going to send out a, a little remind and, and come and have a meal with us. And we're going to have a great time with Jesus. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you, his people, and may he give you his shalom, his peace. All God's people said. I want you to know, sing this song and realize you are a friend of God's.